How's it going you guys? It's been a year now since I created the channel and I wanted to celebrate by doing a quick Q&A and answering some of your guys' questions that may be out there. I posted out on Discord, Matrix, and YouTube asking what sort of questions you may have. If I don't get a chance to answer your question in this video or maybe you had a question but didn't notice these posts, then be sure to comment down below with your question and I'll answer them at a later time. So the first question I got was how did you first come up on Linux? And I'm assuming that you're kind of just asking how did I first find out or start using Linux. And so this one could be kind of be its own video, but I'll just try and summarize it really quickly and cover some of the major bullet points. First considered using Linux, it was in earlier points of my university degree. I kind of had a surface level uh, knowledge of it from one of my roommates who actually had ran Linux for a short period of time. But honestly, whenever I asked him about it, he didn't really have much to say, so I never really got that inspired. But as I looked into my degree, at the time I was in electrical engineering, I ended up coming across Linux more and more because uh, I was inspired by embedded systems. That was kind of the field that I was focused on. And uh, embedded Linux was kind of where things were starting to point towards for a lot of different uh, things that I was interested in. Now, while I thought of Linux more as something that I could play around with, I never really thought of it as being a replacement for Windows. However, as I was going through my degree, I started to get more and more frustrated with how slow Windows was to do basic tasks, specifically stuff like opening a file manager, which theoretically should be a pretty quick process, but on Windows took a few minutes, even with an SSD. So I kind of just didn't really see much point in uh, opening files. If anything, I just kept them on my desktop to just avoid it. I also wanted to conserve battery life, and I kind of wanted to know more about what's going on underneath the system. And sadly, as a result with Windows, it's kind of hard to really understand all of this. So the next best thing was to look at Linux. I considered it for a while, and since I was in electrical engineering, I kind of didn't really think it would work out just because I wasn't really able to use a lot of the tools that I needed for my degree, at least at my university. However, I ended up switching my major to software engineering, which ended up giving me the opportunity to start using Linux. And then it was as simple as that. I tried out on a virtual machine, and within a few weeks, I was pretty much completely on Linux. Uh, I had it installed on my system, deleted Windows, all that sort of stuff. So I was pretty much all in at that point. My next question is actually kind of a two-parter. So the first part, it is what was your first programming language back then? Uh, my first programming language was C. And the next question is, what is the first programming language that you recommend others learn now? Um, so there's a few different approaches to this. First one is just if you want to get your feet wet, maybe if you don't have much of a technical background but you're interested in programming, then something like Python is pretty easy to get started with. Uh, you can actually do it in the browser. And then there's also the option of using JavaScript, which I would recommend if you just want to get a job as soon as possible. Web development jobs are pretty lucrative. They're around all over the place. So obviously learning JavaScript or TypeScript is a pretty good option there. Um, and then finally, if you just wanted to learn to program and kind of make the most of it that you could, I'm completely biased in this, but I personally prefer C um, just because I find that it gives you a very bottom up approach. And then once you've gone from C, you kind of understand what advantages are there to different things. I find a lot of people that go from the top down end up having a lot of issues with understanding exactly why you'd use something like an array versus a list, um, because a lot of languages allow all arrays to be dynamic. Anyways, I could go a lot further into this, but that's kind of my idea is that if you want something simple, go with Python. Um, if you want something that will get you a job as soon as possible, probably JavaScript. And if you want to learn from the bottom up, like I prefer to do for a lot of things, then like something like C, you'll actually learn more things than I feel like you will if you use like assembly. I feel like a lot of assembly is like, it's a very simple language. There's not really much to it. That's kind of the whole point of it. And so as a result, you don't really learn a lot of programming practices from it. And you can apply a lot of what you learn from C to other languages. This one is yet again, another two-parter. Uh, the first part is when did you know Linux was for you? Um, honestly, when I started using it on a virtual machine, I was actually trying out KDE, the desktop environment, and I kind of just realized how nice it looked, how easy it was to work with, um, and I kind of felt like I wasn't missing too much. In addition, I feel like I kind of just loved the performance that I got out of it compared to when I was using Windows, so I felt like I got the best of both worlds. I got something that looked nice and I could use around other people and they wouldn't think I was too much of a dork. And then I also got the performance that I was looking for that I was kind of annoyed with Windows not providing. In addition, when I wrote my first shell script uh, and realized how easy it is to automate things in Linux, it really sold me on the idea, and I kind of didn't really see any myself ever going back to Windows at that point. The second question that comes with this was also, what are your plans for the future when it comes to your content? Now, this is a question I've asked myself quite a few times. I know that a lot of my content is fairly niche, and as a result, it doesn't really blast off when it comes to subscriptions, um, as well as the videos a lot of the time don't really do like an amazing um, amazingly well right out of the gate. 
but I do see that long term that they're getting a lot of views, so they're definitely being helpful and people are still looking for this sort of content. So I think I'm pretty happy with where the content and the channel is at. Well, the channel is still pretty small. I've been pretty happy with the community that we've built up. It's a pretty small but pretty interesting community. Uh, everybody's super kind and fun, and so that's kind of what I want to maintain as well as I'm pretty happy with the kind of content I'm making. In fact, a lot of my videos are about tools that I actually use and tools that I have something to say about or topics I have something to say about. Um, I don't really want to make content just for the sake of content. That's kind of the one thing that I've really wanted to avoid in my videos. And there has been a few instances where I've started to cave, but I've been kind of happy that I haven't gone too far into it. I don't want to end up going down a rabbit hole of just making distro reviews and stuff like that. So in summary, my plans for future content is basically keep doing the same thing. Obviously increase the quality of the content, format it a bit better so it's a bit more interesting for you guys to watch and all that sort of stuff. I just want to make the best content I can uh, for those of you guys that are out there and those of you that want to see content Content like mine. Now the next question is what are your thoughts on privacy and the ethics side of free software? Uh, on the privacy side, I think it's a great thing to not get locked down into too much of the uh, interlinking between websites, different services, knowing too much about you. Um, mostly from the context of getting information leaked. I'm not really quite as worried as some other people are about the idea of like maybe Google having a bit of information on me. I understand that there is things that I could do to minimize that and I try to do a decent amount of effort into it, but I don't really go that crazy with it. Um, maybe I should be going more crazy. I'm not really too sure. I'm always open to a little chat about that. But on the ethics side, I'm all for kind of the idea of where RMS kind of talks about the idea of freedom of the code letting people see it uh, because on it, the idea of trusting trust is something that you're really never supposed to do. There's a whole paper on that that I recommend you guys can go ahead and take a look at if that interests you. But that's kind of where I see it as well as as a programmer. I love the idea of being able to fix code, resolve issues and stuff like that that have been around for a long time. Or maybe I have a feature that I want to add. I could even fork the project if the maintainer or creator doesn't want to add that. Um, a great example of this is something like NeoVim, where people had a different opinion to how Bram was running things. They wanted to start their own project. And there's a ton of stuff like that out there in the world. And that's kind of why I think it's great, as well as you don't really have to worry as much about people stealing your information and stuff if you can see the code. That being said, everybody kind of talks about how Chromium has issues like that. And once a code base is so big, it's really hard to spot small things like that. But I think there's a lot of like benefits to it. Like when you look at something like Blender that has made a whole community, makes free movies, and just like has a group of inspiring developers, uh, that's kind of where I feel like the real benefit of uh, open source and free software comes in. Now moving on to the next question, you mentioned in a live stream that you took an astronomy class. Uh, what are slash were you going to school for? So I am technically still a student in software engineering. I have about a year theoretically left in my degree, um, probably less than that really. Uh, the big thing is that I still have a lot of co-ops. Basically, I was required to take a complementary science, which is why I took physics. Uh, at the university I go to, um, software engineering is basically the same as our computer science degree, just with more courses, and you have to do uh, 16 months of co-op, which is what I'm doing right now. A co-op is basically just a paid internship. And the next question that this individual had was any workflow tips for math or physics homework with G slash trough, so any form of trough like graph or Neutroff and such. Um, probably the first few things would be like having a simple way to manage snippets. Uh, don't go too crazy with snippets. I only use like a few for just defining like EQN sections, um, pick sections, stuff like that. Uh, but the other one was actually trying to uh, predefine things ahead of time. So if you're in a class and you write things out repeatedly, I usually try to define them. Um, as well as I try to have a macro for a question. So I basically have a Q macro and then an A macro. And so every time we have a question in class, I do the Q macro and I give it the argument of whatever the question in class was, and then the answer. And then I basically define that macro to have a, this is gonna be a bit complex if you're not used to graph or trough, but I basically have a keep start and a keep end that will basically keep those sections together. So every time I have a question, it will put that answer nice and close by so that way I can actually see it per, and it will try and keep it on the same page. Um, that's kind of something I recommend. Uh, in addition, also having a quick way to take screenshots and add that is always useful if uh, maybe you're falling a bit behind in class and you need to catch up. Just having a way to import a screenshot is always useful. I have a whole video on that um, in my Groff series.
If you're wondering why I'm kind of talking a bit fast, it's just because I have a bit of a cold and I'm just trying to avoid coughing in the middle of my sentences. Now moving on to the next question, are you still using Qt Browser as your primary browser? Yes, I am. Um, right now I'm actually using Nixt uh, for an upcoming video, but uh, usually I would use Qt Browser. I just wanted to try something new. Uh, do I do any special uh, hardening steps, so preventing cookies, trackers, etc.? Um, pretty much I don't really do any of that sort of stuff involving the privacy hardening. Um, I probably should do something, but I really haven't implemented much of it. Um, as I said before, I don't go too crazy on that sort of stuff, but maybe I should be more worried about it. One thing I do use is the uh, recently added Brave. Um, so from the Brave browser, they added in a functionality for ad blocking into Qt Browser that is based on Brave. Um, so some would say that that's an extra bit of hardening, but some would not say that. So now moving on to the next question, what are your favorite programming languages and why? Um, so I would say my favorites are C, um, Racket, as well as Scheme, Common Lisp. Those all, all those uh, Lisps right there can kind of just all go in the same sort of loop. And then I also really like POSIX Shell. Um, I don't use it for everything, um, but some things like Quick Looks Little Scripts, it's always a fun little easy thing to get started with. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my favorite languages. Um, and why? Uh, well, I love C because it's low level and it's the language that I honestly have the most experience with and have played with the longest. Um, I wouldn't call myself an expert in it. It's just what I've done the most programming in. Um, all the Lisps is just because I like Lisp. Um, it, that kind of deserves its own video. Explaining why you like Lisp is a pretty big thing. POSIX shell, just because it's really simple. Um, pretty much anyone can get started with it. And it's a uh, really easy way to just take something that you repeatedly use and speed it up just a tad bit more. Another question somebody asked is, uh, what are your thoughts on Nix and GUIX? Um, I think Nix uh, is pretty interesting. Um, both of them have their pros and cons. The idea is basically that these are package managers that are intended to be basically declared in a functional language. And that's kind of where the similarities are, uh, as well as there is an entire operating system dedicated to them, but they can be used as standalone packages or package managers, sorry. Well, I think both the projects are actually really interesting. I never really got that into Nix, um, mostly just because I've never really had much interest in the language that it uses. It's pretty inspired by Haskell, but it's also a dynamic language, so it's kind of a bit strange, but that's kind of interesting, but I haven't really gotten much into it. Uh, GUIX is something that I really have considered actually using, but uh, purely because of its like FOSS forward um, mindset, which is great, but it kind of has a lot of tools and certain drivers and stuff like that that I would rather have first party support rather than feeling like I'm going around the disk row to make things work. Um, as far as using them as package managers, I haven't used GUIX, but I do use Nix at work uh, for third party packages mostly for things that I use at work that I kind of want the most recent release of. Yeah, that's basically my experience and my thoughts on them. Uh, I, once again, don't have too many thoughts because I haven't used them personally very much. Also, as a Lisp fan, as you guys probably know, uh, GUIX gets the big advantage of being written in a scheme called Guile. Um, and as I said before, Scheme is one of my favorite languages, so that is really cool. Um, but I haven't really seen much desire to really use it. All right, so the next question is pretty loaded. Uh, will you ever try out OpenBSD, Plan 9, or Inferno? Um, I have actually tried out OpenBSD and Plan 9, uh, but I haven't gotten a chance to try out Inferno. Maybe one day. I don't really know if I'll ever stick with BSD for very long term, just mostly because I don't have much of a security background, um, as well as I don't really take advantage of a lot of its features. While I am all for the minimalism side of things, uh, there is a limitation of not supporting Bluetooth, which I know might sound silly, but Bluetooth is kind of just something that I rely on it, uh, with more and more technology using it. It's just becoming something that I don't really want to sacrifice having available to me. When it comes to Plan 9, I have actually played around a decent amount with it. I installed it on a stream, as well as have played around with a lot of its tools that have been ported to Linux and Unix. But I haven't really gone very far with it, mostly just because I'll try out the tools for a bit, I'll start to like them, but since they're non-standard, I never really use them too much. Maybe I'll play with Plan 9 again in my personal time a bit more, and if I end up coming up with a bit more to say about it, maybe I'll do a video on the concept, or at least give you guys a bit of a tour, uh, just a quick little video on the topic, um, trying to cover things that I haven't seen in other videos or other content out there. The next question I have is, do you use Roth? For note taking, uh, for quite a while I actually used it for university notes. I do not use it for personal notes. Um, for that I use org. 
not really for any reason besides org is just like a nice file format. And even without syntax highlighting, it's fairly easy to read. Markdown is also a great option. I just like org. However, for classes, uh, specifically math and physics classes and some programming classes, I would take my notes in uh, Roth, specifically Groff. Um, and I had a few different hacks to speed things up. But yeah, so I have used it for note taking. I really liked the output of it um, and I used it for all my university notes. When it comes to Neutroff, which I do prefer on a conceptual level, um, it's not very great for university notes just because its image support isn't great. And sometimes you don't really have the ability to just do everything in text. Sometimes you need to take a picture and put that in there. Though one of the issues that I did have with the images has been resolved by yours truly uh, submitted as a very, very simple patch. It wasn't actually too big of a change. So I could see people fixing the other issues with it, and that would be uh, pretty great if those all get fixed. Um, I will personally go ahead and make a video on it. Um, even though there's not many people watching those, I know that uh, it would be good for somebody to know how it works. Now, moving on to the next two-part question, we have what inspired you to start your YouTube channel and what inspires you to keep doing it when you're in? So there's a few different inspirations. The first one was that there wasn't really a lot of content out there on Groff or Trough. And I had quite a decent amount of background in it. I had written a resume with it. Um, I also used it for a few different classes uh, for homework and notes. So I was kind of inspired to give a bit more information out there for the world to use. As well as I don't really like writing a lot. I didn't really want to write a blog about it. Um, also, the odds that people would see that is just so small. Um, so I decided to kind of consider making a YouTube channel there. The other thing that kind of inspired me was just the amount of inaccuracies um, I saw in a lot of videos on specific topics that I had a decent amount of background in. Um, the biggest one being Vim. I saw a lot of videos on Vim where there was just a lot of inaccuracies in them. Um, I myself have made mistakes before, so I'm not saying that nobody makes mistakes. This was actually a pretty inspired by a YouTube channel that I recommend called Greg Harold. He makes great videos on Vim. And so I kind of wanted to make a bit more content similar to his. Um, if you guys aren't subscribed to his channels and you're interested in Vim, I highly recommend it. And the final thing that inspired me was a fellow YouTuber named Brian Jenks, who uh, actually encouraged me to pursue Groff videos. So uh, that's why my first video is a very poorly done uh, Groff video, which is one of the like top five of my channel. <laughs> and finally, I wanted to give a thank you to Palatinus, Car, DFDX, and Tall Guy Jenks for supporting the channel. These are the people who support me on GitHub Sponsors. If you guys want to support me through GitHub Sponsors, there's a link down in the description that you guys can go ahead and click on if you guys want to support this channel. Um, I really appreciate it. If you guys sat through this whole video, hopefully you enjoy my content. Um, outside of that, I just wanted to say thanks to all you guys for sticking through this for an entire year those of you guys that have been here since the start, I really appreciate it. And if you guys want to help keep this channel going, then be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that bell icon so you guys will get notified of my next video. Anyways, guys, I'll see you later.